Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ariane Herrick. I'm from the University of Manchester and Salford Royal Hospital in Greater Manchester. Um, it's a great privilege to be with you all this evening, and I'm very grateful to Carlos for the invitation to participate. I'm going to give the first um, section of the meeting this evening. I'm going to talk about medical management or a medical overview, rather, of systemic sclerosis. And my colleague, um, Ms. Lindsay Muir, is going to cover the surgical aspects. And we work very closely at Salford Royal and have done for many years. And I hope that together we manage to provide a, a good service for the patients um, with, with systemic sclerosis and, and hand problems. I always like to start with a slide because it demonstrates to me very well the pain, the disability, and the disfigurement relating to the hand in the patient with systemic sclerosis. And this is obviously a severe example. This was a young woman who came in with acute ischemia of her middle finger, but you can see also the ravages of more chronic ischemia in the other fingers, and the fact that she has fibrosis, she has a thickened skin, which has resulted in marked contracture. And so as well as showing all the agony of systemic sclerosis, it also exemplifies the disease process, which is a combination of ischemia and fibrosis. And this ischemia and fibrosis occurs also in the internal organs. And that is what's responsible for the high mortality of these disease, this disease. Unfortunately, many patients develop um, severe cardiorespiratory problems or gastrointestinal or renal issues. And, um, and they can have a very significant um, set of problems in, in this regard. But this evening we're con concentrate on the hand problems and I'm going to focus on the digital vasculopathy. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the skin thickening. I'm not going to cover calcinosis, but Lindsay will say a little bit about that later on. But suffice it to say that calcinosis can be a very major problem with the hands. And unfortunately we have no medical cure for it at present. So I'm going to cover the different points in the slide. I'm going to start off with a case history of a fairly typical um, case of uh, the sort of patient that I, I would share with, with Lindsay. I'm going to cover terminology, the spectrum of digital vasculopathy, and finally management. So we start off with a case just to really set the scene. Um, this young woman I first met back in 2017. At that time, she had a history of Reynolds phenomenon for eight years and has had digital ulceration for two or three years. She had skin thickening, which was confined to the finger for around eight years. And so because the skin thickening was confined to the extremities, she had the limited cutaneous subtype of systemic sclerosis as opposed to the diffuse cutaneous subtype. But she still had very significant problems related to her digital vasculopathy. And she also had significant internal organ involvement in that already by the time I met her, she was known to have interstitial lung disease, shown in the X-ray when you can see basal fibrosis, also seen in CT, and her TLCO, her diffusion, was already down at 51% predicted. So this was not good in a woman of 33 years old. She had difficulty swallowing, which is very typical in systemic sclerosis, and fortunately she had stopped smoking. So on examination, she had sclerodectomy of the fingers, that means skin thickening of the fingers, and she also had digital pitting, which we'll see in a minute on the slide, which is very typical. In fact, it's almost pathognomonic of systemic sclerosis. On blood testing, she was positive for anti-SCL70, or otherwise termed anti-topoisomerase, and this is very much a specific autoantibody for systemic sclerosis, and often associates with lung disease, which we know that she had. And she had abnormal nail fold capillaroscopy shown here. Some of you will be familiar with this technique. It's a beautiful way to non-invasively visualize the microcirculation. And normally you should see evenly spaced hairpin-like loops. And here the microvasculature is very distorted, reflecting the disease process. And already when I saw her, she tried um, nifedipine and sildenafil, but unfortunately she'd been intolerant of these base dilator therapies, but we did manage to re-establish her later on the Fedipine and later on. And over the years, she's had recurrent digital ulcers. And this just shows one typical example. This was back in 2018. And you can see this necrotic ulcer, 
with loss of the of the of the tissue and around that. And in the other finger, she can you can see a typical example of digital pitting, which is one of the pathognomonic features of systemic sclerosis. So what happened over the intervening three years? Well, we did give her an oral based dilator treatment with nifedipine. We urged her to report um, quickly if she developed any infections around ulcers, any redness or increased pain, because we have a low threshold for giving an antibiotic because they're often um, infected. She had several admissions for infusions of intravenous isoprost, which is a very powerful base dilator. She's had some surgical debridements, um, exemplifying uh, the networking between um, physicians and surgeons. Firstly, in May 2018, she had her left middle finger debrided and she also had some Botox injections at the same time. Um, she had she's had three surgical procedures actually just before um, Christmas. In November, she had a left index finger debrided with Botox injections. I'll show you a photograph. In November, her right middle was very problematic. And in December, um, she again had surgery to left index finger. And when she had some necrotic tissue removed and some of the pus that was sent to microbiology at that time grew and um, staph. And she did in fact receive antibiotics on each occasion, but on this last occasion, she had uh, specifically intravenous flu clocks and followed by oral condomycin and rifampicin on microbiological advice. Now we subsequently started both Centan, which some of you will know is an endothelial receptor antagonist. And in fact, she already feels that she's benefiting from that. It's licensed as well as for pulmonary artery hypertension for prevention of recurrent ulcers. We would have liked to start that earlier, but um, there were various issues, uh, meaning that we couldn't. For example, she had a pregnancy last year, which obviously um, caused a little bit of concern. And um, one of the mainstays of management is for her to seek medical advice as soon as uh, uh, an ulcer develops. And I strongly believe that that's one of the key aspects of management. And just to show you these photographs, it's very difficult for us. We try and operate an open door policy and ask patients to contact us as soon as they get lesions uh, shown here. But of course, with the COVID pandemic, this has been difficult. As I said to you, this young woman has interstitial lung disease. So she's in a very high risk group and would be in the social shielding or clinically extremely vulnerable group. But we encourage her to send photographs, which she did. And you can see the photographs of the left index finger and the right middle finger, which were subsequently debrided. And um, this, the photographs were just taken two or three days before her surgery. So we had a fairly um, rapid access for her and she felt very much improved after the debridements. And the last photo on the right was taken because actually I telephoned her on Friday, just checking that she didn't mind if I presented her case. And she said, well, actually I've got an ulcer on my middle finger, but I'm not too worried about it. It's getting better. But I asked her to show me a photograph anyway. And as you'll see, it doesn't look too worrying. It's not an erythematous or angry looking. And given that she said it was getting better, I wasn't particularly concerned about it. So I didn't ask her to come up to the hospital. But I think that's been a key facet of management. So we'll come back a little bit when we talk about management for that particular case. But I'd like to just talk about terminology, because I think that can be a bit confusing and about the spectrum of systemic sclerosis related to digital vasculopathy. And first of all, in terminology, there's a little bit of confusion between scleroderma and systemic sclerosis, and the terms are often used interchangeably. And just to say that scleroderma simply means thickened skin, and there is a differential diagnosis to that. But for the purposes of this evening, we're talking about the multi-system connective tissue disease, systemic sclerosis of which the most characteristic manifestation is scleroderma. And the acronym CREST um, simply means, um, simply stands for five of the clinical features of systemic sclerosis. And that's as many of you know, calcinosis, rhinos, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, or telangiectasis. And there's a sort of myth that this is some sort of separate disease. It's not. As I say, it's just a representation of five of the clinical features, and it's tended to fall out of favour a little bit because it has been a confusing term. And the final point to say about terminology is that Raynaud's phenomenon can be primary or it can be secondary. And some of you here will have primary Raynaud's. It's very common. It affects 5 to 10% of the population. But there always is a differential diagnosis 
And we always have to consider the differential diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomenon, as shown here. This is a classic triphasic color change of white and then blue and then red, although many patients will only have a biphasic change and not a full triphasic change. But the key point really is to explain the Raynaud's. And while most people will have primary Raynaud's, you have to consider the possibility of an underlying disease. And of course, of most interest to the rheumatologist are the connective tissue diseases particularly systemic sclerosis, when Raynaud's can be very severe. But there are other differential diagnoses, and some of which are shown here. Now, one of the key questions is why do patients with primary Raynaud's phenomenon, which is just so common, not progress to the problems that I've shown you with this young woman that I presented earlier? And the problem is in systemic sclerosis that the digital vasculopathy is structural as well as functional, and that's a key difference. In primary Raynaud's, the vessels are structurally normal. It's simply a vasospasm, an exaggeration of the physiological response to cold. And by definition, it's entirely reversible. Whereas in patients with systemic sclerosis, as shown here on the right, these are nail fold capillaroscopy appearances. And in a healthy control subject, you will get nice evenly spaced capillaries. Whereas in a patient with systemic sclerosis, you get these highly abnormal microvessels. They're large, or at least some of them are, or, and they're few and far between. And that's one of the issues in the microvasculature, but also in the, at the digital artery level. And on the left, you can see a digital artery from an amputation specimen. And you can imagine how difficult, of course, this was a very advanced case that came to amputation, but you can imagine how difficult it is to maintain the perfusion through these vessels. So that's why patients with systemic sclerosis can go on to get this horrendous digital vasculopathy. And how common is this amongst patients with systemic sclerosis? Well, it's actually very common. And virtually all patients with systemic sclerosis will have Raynaud's phenomenon. It's the most common presenting feature and it occurs in over 95% of patients. And about 50% of patients will develop one or more digital ulcers during the course of their illness, ulcers as we've seen earlier in the young woman who I presented. And you can see examples of digital ulcers at the bottom. We, the lady I presented had digital tip ulcers, but you can also ulcerate over, particularly over the extensor aspects, particularly as shown here, for example, over flexion contractors. And then a small minority of patients will go on to develop critical ischemia as shown in the bottom right. But that's always, you know, a feared complication. That's always a medical emergency. So we always worry about these, about these kind of things. So I'd like to turn on the last few slides on talking about management, remembering our patient who I presented um, earlier on. And if any of you are interested to look at management in a bit more detail, um, the UK Scleroderma Study Group published this um, article now five years ago, and it's a little bit out of date. But I've deliberately chosen it because I think it's almost good that it's out of date because it has shown that um, we've made a little bit of progress um, since this was published. And I'm going to show you two flow charts. There's a third also in the paper on critical ischemia. But the first flow chart is for Raynaud's phenomenon. I'm not going to go through every single point in the slide. But I think the first thing in the management of Raynaud's is to establish what the diagnosis is. And perhaps there's something underlying it you have cervical rib, a cryoglobulinemia or something which is amenable to, to treatment. But then the mainstay of management is patient education and that will be sufficient in many patients with primary anos. But for example, in systemic sclerosis, most patients will require some sort of drug treatment and apologies for all the abbreviations, but the first line therapy is with a CCB or calcium channel blocker as in our patient who's on nifedipine. And I think one of the changes that's occurred in the last few years is that phosphodiesterase inhibitors, for example, um, sildenafil or Viagra used to be quite far down the pathway, but now they've been moved right up the pathway. And in fact, most people would consider a phosphodiesterase inhibitor a second line treatment now, especially in systemic sclerosis related renos. And we often use them in combination with calcium channel blockers. And the other oral medications, there's very little evidence based for, but um, people do use them. And then occasionally we give, well, we sometimes do give antiplatelet agents because there's, there's suspicion, but there is platelet activation and systemic screws, although you have to worry about the gastrointestinal side effects 
And if these things don't work, then we would consider intravenous prostanoids. Um, as happened in our patient, but we seldom use these, or at least I seldom use them unless the patient has actually gone on to develop ulceration or critical ischemia, but to other people use them a little bit more frequently. And I think in some European countries, intravenous prostanoids are really used um, a, a lot more. And if none of these things work and the patient progresses, as our patient progressed to additional ulceration or critical ischemia, then we go down um, uh, and the top point is to establish a diagnosis of a digital ulcer early. And again, I emphasize this again. I think a key point is to ask patients to let you know soon if you get an ulcer. And I think that prevents us from seeing these horrendous ulcers with underlying bone infection are really extremely difficult to do. And the next thing you do once you establish a patient's got an ulcer is to find out whether there's anything that could be uh, amenable to treatment, for example, super added treatment or maybe concomitant large vessel disease. And patients with systemic sclerosis, while it's mainly a small vessel problem or a digital artery problem, they can get concomitant arterial disease just like everybody else. And there's a school of thought that there may be an increased prevalence of large vessel disease. So if there's an exacerbation of digital ulceration, especially if it's unilateral, you always need to worry about that and just make sure that the peripheral pulses and the peripheral vasculature is well assessed. And then wound care is important, analgesia, these ulcers are excruciating and patients often will require opiates, hopefully in the short term. We maximise our vasodilator treatment in the same way as for Raynaud's phenomenon. And then we obviously um, are very much in communication with our surgical colleagues, or all of you here, and consider surgical debridement in patients with necrotic tissue or underlying calcinosis. And I would say that our patient that I presented, as I said earlier, was very pleased with the results of her surgery and it allowed her to, to um, get on and make a much um, more rapid recovery, I'm sure, than had she not had the, the surgery. And then if the ulcers are recurrent, then we need to think of other measures. And ERA in the slides stands for endothelial receptor antagonists like Bocentan, which I mentioned earlier in our patient's case. And interestingly, that's also now moved up the pathway with COVID because we tend to prescribe Bocentan a lot more than we used to. Um, and we try to prevent the patient having to come in for intravenous ileprost infusion. And if all these things are ineffective, then we, we may consider, um, well, we would obviously discuss with yourselves whether or not a, a digital sympsectomy or some other form of intervention um, might be required. Um, I forgot to mention that I meant to go off at a slight tangent uh, up in the green box here. I meant to move the slide on, so my apologies. But I just wanted to come back to early up in the pathway, just considering the possibility of underlying infection. And to me, one of the great advances in the last 10 years in the management of ulcers and patients with systemic sclerosis is recognising that actually so many of them do have an underlying osteomyelitis. And I think we recognize this now with early MR scanning because this patient, not the patient that I presented, but another patient who Lindsay and I um, knew very well um, over the years um, had recurrent ulcers like this. And you can see the bone marrow edema on the MR scan. And she had a protracted course of, um, of antibiotic, which did heal up the ulcer. And I think that's important because I think when I came to Salford, 15% of the patients with systemic sclerosis had had one or more digital amputation. And now we have very few digital amputations. And I think one of the things is really getting this open door policy, looking at the ulcers quickly, deciding whether they've got underlying osteomyelitis and, refer, and treating them appropriately and also with the early debridement, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So that's, the, and that's then the, the rest of the pathway which we've discussed earlier. So to summarize, we've discussed the different points on this on the slide here. I just like to conclude by saying that a lot of the pain and disability of systemic sclerosis, which affects patients on a day-to-day -day basis and comes from the hands. And I think we have to remember that, the contracture, and you've seen pictures of it, the, the horrendous vasculopathy and the calcinosis, which I didn't mention too much of, but which can really be a huge problem as well. So again, these things, you know, we very much look to yourselves for help with and we're very grateful to you. I think a combined um, medical and surgical approach is absolutely key to management. Um, ideally, we should all aspire to an open door access for patients with digital ulcers. And I think the good news is that new therapies have been and are being developed. I mentioned the case of phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Ten years ago, we really weren't using these hardly. 
Perenos, but we're using them a lot now. And I think they've been very helpful. And I think we're much more proactive in our approach. And there are other agents which are currently um, being researched for Reynolds and for digital alteration. And so that's all, all I have to, to say at the moment. Thanks very much.